Jason and I'm with the coalition and we're very excited to bring this um, presentation to you today. Uh, we are going to wait a couple more minutes as we have a pretty large attendance for this webinar. Um, um, see who else joins and then we will get started. Okay, for the interest of time, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to do a couple housekeepings before we um, get started. We have a large attendance on this um, webinar, so I will be keeping everyone's lines muted during the webinar, um, but you are welcome to ask questions in the question box of the webinar um, portal that you have on the side of your screen. Um, and you can also raise your hand, and I can unmute your phone um, during those question periods. Um, but you must have your audio PIN number entered in in order to be able to talk. So if you raise your hand and you don't have the audio PIN number in, I can't unmute your line to hear you. So please make sure if you do want to talk during the webinar that you enter in the audio PIN number um, and raise your hand if you have questions and I'll unmute your line. Or you can again um, enter your question in the question box and I will ask the question for uh, Peggy to answer. And we're very excited to have Peggy here to do this webinar for us. Um, we've uh, worked with her previously with the wellness coaching um, and on this initiative with the 2015 wellness coaching and these um, wonderful webinars that we're able to uh, offer you guys. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Peggy and we will get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to um, our webinar session this uh, Friday, good Friday afternoon. I'm hoping everyone's getting ready for a really nice weekend. Um, today, we're going to really spend a little time using a well, looking at a wellness approach to smoking cessation, and really um, a lot of what we've kind of covered here are some things that perhaps in your work or in your life you may have come across them, many of these ideas, but hopefully today you'll come away with some ideas around how we can help others in terms of cutting down or quitting smoking. Um, I come to you from New Jersey. Um, I work at the Rutgers University in the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions, and there I do some teaching and a lot of work around health and wellness projects. I also work full-time at Collaborative Support Programs of New Jersey, running their uh, Wellness Institute, where we develop a lot of um, trainings, technical assistance, and really practical tools that we've been able to help people in recovery use to pursue their recovery and maintain their recovery. So I'm really excited today to bring you this presentation that's going to pull together some of um, those um, information from both of the um, Rutgers and Collaborative Support Programs and hopefully really be some things you can put to, into action in your day-to-day -day work helping support people you care about. The uh, overview of the day, we have a little bit of an agenda and some learning objectives which I want to review now and hopefully at the end of the time we can make sure I've covered them adequately and or you have the opportunity to follow up with me at any time for any of the resources I may have mentioned or any problem solving around how do you really put this into action in your day to day. So today we want to talk about something we already know but just really understand the data around tobacco use and tobacco dependence among people that we serve, people served by the public mental health system and really understand why that data is really um, causing us to be in a, a webinar today and doing some of the work you're doing around health and wellness to help really help change some of the statistics we know about how this um, information is really impact. We're, we have information that people's lifespan and quality of life is impacted and hopefully by understanding how to help people to manage their tobacco dependence as we do with other kind of addictions how we can better help empower people to pursue their recovery. So understand some information around the data, 
understand the idea of smoking culture, how the culture perhaps of our program, our agency, might be fostering um, people's ability to really apply many of the concepts we're going to talk about or how we can develop a smoking culture around helping people to cut down and quit and understand some of the mechanisms in our culture that might be supporting people's efforts to continue to um, smoke or continue to maintain their dependence rather than helping people to deal with those issues more effectively for their recovery. Really then highlight the challenges which we know and then really look at a number of strategies that can really help people. And these are things you can do, things you can link people to. The um, objectives being that we'll understand the prevalence of the people that we serve, understand and defining that smoking culture, and then really look at some of the skills you already have or you can continue to enhance motivational interviewing skills, understanding recognition of stages of change and how and where you can in all stages be engaging people and supporting people. And the new concept that might be new for some people called the five A's. And then we'll wrap up by really pulling it together by using a wellness approach, pulling together those skills, under understanding around smoking culture, smoking trends, how we can use this wellness approach to support people's efforts towards cutting down or quitting smoking. At any, I'm going to stop at certain intervals to ask either to put your questions or responses into the chat or open it up to um, uh, a dialogue because I think it's going to be important as we go through these three phases of the different areas that we get some dialogue and some questions and some really good problem solving around what you're doing already or what you can do with this information. So this is what I'm hoping we accomplish and we'll check at the end to see how well I did this and how hopefully well this helps you in your work. So really why we're here is that there's a very extremely troubling trend that we've known about quite a while but data has come about and I think um, uh, Dr. Parks in your state was a big, pers big um, person who had a lot of work around almost 10 years ago with the report that came out that started to look at the health disparities facing people. And from that report that was done by Dr. Parks and a number of other people around the country that really showed the health disparity facing people served by the public mental health system, we started to see some aspects of that, num those, that data about people dying sooner or having poorer quality of life. And a major troubling trend that we knew was that people have higher smoking rates in, than the general population, knowing that people consume a significant amount of the cigarettes sold in this country, and we know these are the poorest people often buying those cigarettes, or, you know, the, the tobacco. Higher, late, uh, higher levels of nicotine dependence, that's something that we don't necessarily always bring into our mind. We think people smoke, we know it's an addiction, but sometimes we don't always see it at the same as it's a, you know, it is an addiction, there is a dependence, and maybe starting to see how we can use some of our approaches that we use for people in terms of their drug and their alcohol addictions to really translate that into helping people to cut down or quit smoking um, and how we can look at that. There's lower cessation rates, so there hasn't been a lot of, um, even though there has some really been some good efforts, Dr. Williams, who's the person cited right in this um, slide, which I encourage you to look at her work because she's an amazing expert in this um, area, which I've given you a lot of resources, but we don't, they don't have as much success, which is, this is something I think you guys are going to be able to help change that trend by, un, by doing things like this, learning more and supporting people more. We can change that trend. And there's a lot of health and financial burden from smoking with the people that we serve. So people get, have much more burden related to the smoking. And uh, just to further look at the data, um, you know, tobacco-related conditions contribute to 53% of deaths for people with schizophrenia. So that being, we know people with schizophrenia often have um, high rates of smoking, and it often contributes to 53% of the deaths. For people with bipolar disorder, it's 48%, and for people with depression, it's 50%. So really this um, information is really helping us understand that we want to um, 
know that this is putting them at high rates of premature death, and we can help create services and supports that are going to really help people address these health and wellness to improve their life expectancy. So this is some really information that I think we should be thinking about as we um, look at the people we serve and understand that we can do something about it. It is clearly a troubling trend. We also know, and this was some data that we um, had recently where we had um, um, worked on getting some screening data from people around in four states. We developed screenings where we screened people for a lot of their health risks. And we found in our data um, that smokers, not surprising, but we now have some data from four states, 40, almost 500 people were in the um, data set that we looked at, are at greater risk for alcohol abuse. And there's, so there's a very strong correlation, as well as drug abuse. So we see that correlation in how they sometimes go hand in hand. We also saw that people were at greater risk for emphysema, not a surprising um, uh, fact but that's definitely something we see or more, as well as viral hepatitis A, B, and C, and tuberculosis. So um, we were able to see this data really looking at it um, in this population and see that there are these medical, these medi um, as well as behavioral issues that are often really associated with people who, hence, who are smoking. So we have these troubling trends. We have some of this data. There's a lot more data on this. I encourage you to look at it. And you know, as you think about the people you serve, how it compares, how it can influence, what you're thinking about doing to help them. So it can often be quite daunting and very overwhelming and depressing when we hear about this. But the good news, I think, is that people can and do want to quit smoking. I do believe this is strongly. People do want to free themselves. And there's a lot of people who really want to pursue and have. So I want to direct you to, um, I had given you a, um, uh, a little more dis descriptive uh, story of someone who I know who I really, when I met this person years ago, I never ever envisioned, and I shouldn't even be saying this because not having a hopeful attitude, would never have seen this person ever stop smoking because he was a heavy, heavy, heavy smoker. And this was a little, um, I'm going to read a little bit what he wrote when he eventually went and did some advocacy around it after experience he had. He said, I'm an li individual living with mental illness who was a heavy smoker and under the care of the mental he health system and uncountered significant health problems, health problems. I smoked for over 50 years and during my hospital stays and life in boarding homes, Smoking was a reward and a main point of social contact for people like myself who are isolated, lonely, and stigmatized. I did realize then that smoking was a safety problem for these large facilities, and there were fires that killed people due to smoking, and that happens a lot here in New Jersey, I'm sure, in other states. I watched and worried that, about that, but that was not enough to stop my smoking addiction. The true physical toll knocked me out in March of 2005 when I suffered a stroke. Before then and now, I live with serious health problems due to this smoking addiction. Smoking is clearly an addiction and needs to be addressed by facilities. Um, I was fortunate to go through physical rehab and they offered me nicotine replacement to help me fully quit the habit. And um, he is actually smoke-free now, actually 10 years. And what he says is that he urges staff to offer people resources, education, and opportunities to develop the skills and support so they can get the habit. Um, and um, I think that his statement um, is really um, important in, you know, reading that and understanding that. And, you know, it's a really good outcome. I mean, it's a really bad outcome, 50 years, what it did, but he's still He's had a lot of medical things, ups and downs, but I think by him quitting right after that um, was really important and it's helped to continue him despite even having some medical things in those last 10 years. So we do know, and I'm sure all of you have those stories or can start to collect those stories. And often in the work that you're going to do, I encourage you, just like I've done, pull Jack's story together and then I have another story, collect those stories and have those folks 
be there with you doing the work. Um, provide a peer provider experience, the same thing, and I, I won't read it as much, but a smoker for 24, year, 24 years, most like most people, it starts when in the hospital, it came away to manage stress, still learning about the health risk sometimes doesn't, um, be, it's often not enough so often to help mobilize it. Um, but what um, this a peer provider found was that we needing to find replacement activities, things like um, saving the money was a major financial uh, uh, motivator for this person, as well as um, finding other things to do to replace that time, to replace what the smoking did for people. So, and as I said, I'm hopeful now my friends and families will not attend an untimely funeral because that's unfortunately what it will happen often with people having those long-term smoking. So this person was half of what Jack's was, but you know, um, and hopefully then as you look at the data, you can see when do, people do quit, there's immediately, there's ways things, people can improve their health. So those things aside, I encourage you to think about the people who've had success, think about your own success experiences. If you were someone who's cut down or quit, those are all really important stories to be sharing with people as they continue to pursue this and we continue to do this good work. Um, so how can you help um, and what are you doing? You're probably doing a lot of these things already and or maybe these things can help fuel your good efforts towards helping cut people to cut down and or quit smoking. We're next going to talk about smoking culture and what um, and then the other areas as well. So. When we think about um, um, settings and where our culture, and it sounds like you guys are ahead of the curve, which is good. I mean, with Dr. Clark there and a lot of the good efforts you guys have had going, I think you guys are ahead of the curve on this. But in looking at um, some of the um, areas, um, looking at um, mental health treatment facilities around the country, only one in four are really doing anything to help people. To, think about or do cut down or quit smoking. Um, we need to do better about this. I think you guys are already there and that's fantastic and I think that this is something that we can continue to mobilize the efforts of the places that perhaps are not thinking about doing this. But and really it's a sad statistic that only one in four settings are really doing um, anything of thinking about or doing anything about it. Maybe a lot of them are thinking about it so I have to give them that credit but actually doing something help people. Um, so one of the things we've done, and I encourage you if you have the handout um, that I have provided prior to the training, um, we created an assessment of smoking culture rating scale, which is to think about uh, these different um, uh, seven different areas that you can be thinking about assessing your culture. It doesn't mean all, you know, this, the numbers just helping you to think about this. So smoking rules. Thinking about rules for smoking in the different buildings, the vehicles, the location, and where are are there rules? Are they consistently re reinforced? Are they, um, you know, what kind of rules are established in your area? Now, I know in our state, for example, there's lots of rules that have to do by state, so those often influence what's happening inside or outside in the proximity of buildings. But often, many times, behavioral health providers and they've got around those rules sometimes and that probably is not a great thing, but I um, want to help you to think about those kind of rules for smoking uh, in your facilities um, and or where you deliver services in your vehicles and things like that. Getting cigarettes, being the idea of access, you know, uh, maybe many of you are providers out in the community, so this wouldn't be so much relevant, but, you know, are they in the canteen or the vending machines or inside the facilities? Are they, is there access um, to the tobacco products, the cigarettes and or tobacco products? So that's something else to be thinking about and um, thinking about what the practice is around that. I think to myself how crazy it was back in the 80s when I worked in a state psychiatric hospital and what we used to do was basically um, give people cigarettes for, um, you know, being good or following the rules and those kinds of things. So I think the days of that are gone. But um, we were often, 
so late over time until some rules came about, people were giving them as reward systems or had much more access to cigarettes in different facilities. Um, and then the idea of smoke-free access sometimes um, is there a route that you can use because often many times in facilities it's out in front and it's a certain area, but is there a way to get into that facility without having to go through that smoke area because often what happens is many of us know is that those smoke areas become really littered with, um, you know, butts and or very um, the uh, odor or whatever whatever the containers are can become, you know, fire hazards or become just some much of an eyesore in terms of um, as well as just the secondhand smoke people might encounter. Um, um, Smoke-free image, you know, uh, thinking about um, is it visible from the street? That's something that um, many hospitals and provider agencies are thinking about. And then control of smoking odor. Um, so like just for example, many times people putting their coats in the same area with smokers, with people who are smokers because a lot of times that smoke, that smell lingers and or it often sometimes impacts the program furniture, closets and things like that. The use of e-cigarettes, um, that's just a big area and those um, things, uh, what are sometimes people are saying, well, we're promoting that or we're encouraging that. What are we doing about that or are we are doing some um, research around that and understanding, you know, what are the, what is the impact of that and or helping people to become more health literate about some of the dangers or possible problems with that. Um, then the big one, which I think a lot of us can do, a lot of us you probably do do, is sharing information about smoking cessation, finding good information that's available. Dr. Jill Williams, I've given you some things at the end to look at, to find, and finding those um, smoking cessation resources and having them available, displayed in the facility, discussed at meetings, available to people on a regular basis, as well as having people have access to smoking cessation, um, whether it's nicotine anonymous groups, quit centers, um, on site that you have, or resources in the community, and or, which I didn't put here, but some of you who are working with psychiatrists is helping people to get the nicotine replacement and having access to that. And then really what you can do is big thing that can be done is people who've had success celebrating successes of um, their smoking, cutting down, quitting smoking, and sharing that very um, openly with people and thinking about how to do that in more um, regular ways. So what I want to do is just stop for a minute and I want to ask, have a question or a comment for people about what which of the smoking culture do you feel is a strength in your agency or your program or what would be an, one of these ideas that got sparked as a result of thinking about the smoking culture? So I want to open it up to hear if people can share any ways you've been doing these things or things that you're thinking about as a result of hearing some of these ideas. So we want to, you can put in the chat or you can um, op put your hand up and uh, Katie will open it up the call. Hello? I'm not Anyone? seeing hands raised. Oh, nope, here's a nope. question from Jessica oh, Walker. Uh, we had a grant that provided um, nicotine patches and lozenges for mm -hmm. our customers. Great. Lozenges. Wow. That's great. So you really were doing some things to help people to get help with access to smoke cessation um, at, at, um, resources. That's a fantastic thing, step that you've done. So your culture is really scoring high there. Jessica. We have another one from Fred Hudson. He um, said that trying to start a living health life group, um, which includes a group for those who are in the pre-contemplative stage. Great. Yeah, so pre-contemplators, we can do something. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Doing a group living life, that would be a good resource if um, would like to share that with us or to share with the group, that might be something we can all share with each other to see, you know, what the curriculum is like, if it's available, 
um, that would be really great uh, to know and, about. And I open Fred's line if you wanted to um, yeah. speak more on living health yeah. life. Yeah. Fred, would you like to share a little bit about the curriculum, where it's from, and what how how it worked? Uh, yes, this is a curriculum from <clears throat> from actually from another state. And it is a curriculum that is actually based on um, it's it's a two part curriculum. Uh, as I as I stated in my comment, um, there's a group uh, group one which is for those who are in the pre contemplative stage, um, and it's more about education and enhancing motivation. And then uh, there's also group two which is the group that people can um, can move on to uh, when they're ready to actually attempt to quit. Mm -hmm. Great. And how did you find it worked? It, was it um, something that you, it seems like it met the needs of the participants? It's something that my agency is actually using. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't actually started using it at my oh. site. Uh, but it's something I, you know, that we're going to be uh, getting started pretty soon. Oh, excellent! Great, great. That would be great to hear how it goes, and you know, um, maybe share those, figure out how to share those kind of curriculums and um, with people because that's really good um, know, to know that those are available out there. Great. And this is this is uh, available uh, on the internet. Great. Okay, fantastic. If you can share that with Katie, maybe she could get that around to the group on the call and we could, you know, be another tool for you guys to use in your wellness toolbox for helping people cut down or quit. Yeah, that would be great. Any Anyone else want to share anything how, uh, in your smoking culture, something that you're doing or something that the um, assessment helped to maybe think, help you to think that something you might want to do? We have one more from Melanie Shands. Um, our facility includes wellness goals and clients treatment goals. Um, we work with clients on reducing and or quitting smoking throughout the duration of case management services. Okay, great. So it's already part of the, the planning, the treatment planning in the, that, that facility. That's great. And as we hear, it's case management. That's something that case management can help with in addition to other things. It sounds like a really worthy and important goal. Um, well, I really encourage you to think about just the cultural things, these messages, these different elements, and maybe develop a way to think about um, from this assessment, think about your smoking culture and the program and the agencies. What are you doing right? What can you do right now maybe to think about moving forward in um, um, being able to really um, um, enhance your culture to help support people's efforts and like maybe even do a little assessment in your program or with some people to just see how you can use some of the information in this small uh, assessment uh, rating scale to help guide the work that you do in your program and or with people. A lot of times you can really involve, I think the one thing I would say encourage you if you do something like that is get people in recovery also involved in the dialogue, especially around what are some of the possible solutions. So really thinking about these cultural elements, the rules, the policies, the practices, the informal and formal things that are happening that might be supporting or hindering our efforts to help support people. Um, so when we think about um, what we use, and these are all things building probably from all information and knowledge and skills you already have, there's a lot of things within the stages of change models that I'm not going to go into a full you know, detail on that, but I'm going to be pulling from that. And I believe that most of you are really familiar with a lot of that. So it really is a good framework to understand how do we work with that individual, how do we work with um, that um, create a program and how do we really structure and model our um, interventions in our supports that we provide, as well as these five A's and five R's. So thinking about um, the stages of change and what we know about it is that um, even in pre-contemplation when people maybe are not even thinking about change or having it, feeling any control, we can offer support and in interventions and education even in that Stage. And I think the piece is, is to match the way your message and your approach is to that person's 
level of readiness where they're not. They're not really ready to change, so you're not going to help them set goals right now, but you're going to maybe help them to start to build some of their um, ideas around the thinking about why it might be important to change and help them to understand moving into the contemplation phase to start to help them to develop the ability to start to see the pros and cons of why it might be good to cut down or quit and help them to build their readiness around potentially cutting down or quitting smoking. Um, we often many times um, know with stages of change too why it's such an important thing, especially for smoking cessation. And I think about myself who was a many year smoker and took at least about 15 or 16 attempts to prepare and get into action before I really was able to maintain they um, is the bit of relapse, and I probably had about 14 or 15 of them during that process, that that's part of the process for many people. And we want to help to understand that in our interventions and in our supports that that is just something we help people prepare for and helping people to know that it's just not a reason to give up. It could definitely cause some discouragement, but it's part of the smoking cessation or any kind of addiction process and help people to see it from a, as a learning opportunity. So really trying to think about how do we help people to, um, you know, understand where they're at in the stage and not start to put them into groups or giving them literature that might be geared more towards someone in preparation and action and help to um, tailor our approach, the approach we use to have to helping people to cut down and or quit smoking. So um, as it's been mentioned, small stages of changes really guides a lot of the interventions and um, it's definitely a model that we want to be thinking about as we start to help people in this way. Um, the five A's is a model that has come about in the field, um, started really in the um, idea in the medical field and it was it's done, has a lot of research in that um, doctors, where doctors using this with people and has a lot of good evidence for helping people to um, quit smoking. So we're looking at this model and it's a model that you might want to start to think about adopting with people and um, using it in a way that might fit your setting. Asking people about tobacco use on a regular visit, on a regular basis, especially if you know someone's a smoker or they may have even just started to talk about or, um, you know, demonstrated some kind of health issues that might be impacted by, well, it's probably more than likely as we saw are impacted by smoking and or they even are starting to talk about it. So asking people about it on your visits or your outreaches and asking them and then as we're working with them, especially as you relate it to when you know if we use a strength-based perspective and as people may have started to talk about some of their ambivalence or their possible desire, starting to help give that clear message in a personalized way to help people to cut down and or quit smoking, thinking about giving some advising around, you know, making it personalized, not just doing it, um, you know, blanket, just making it cut down and helping them to see how cut down or quitting smoking can help them physically and or in other ways that they may have identified as important. So it's that asking, then in advising, and then started, you know, asking some questions, open-ended questions to ask, you know, are you willing, uh, are you interested or willing to give quitting a try soon? Assessing their interest. Um, you know, if a person's been an ex-smoker, talk to them about how recently um, he or she quit and many of the in any of the challenges they may have encountered, and you know, assessing their motivation. So using open-ended question, using something to help understand people's um, interest and readiness and their confidence to start to make some efforts to change. And as people um, start to really, as you're understanding that they may have this interest, start to assist them, helping them either to brainstorm a plan to quit, um, helping them, um, you know, to link or ask, you know, get into counseling and or any kind of maybe nicotine replacement or other kind of tools that could help them in their efforts. Um, if they're a recent quitter, um, you know, exploring some um, relapse prevention plans that worked or new ones that they can put into place and especially start to help them explore the relapses they may have had to help understand what were those sources that triggered the relapse and 
how that they can perhaps start to think about um, maybe doing something a little differently or tweaking their plan, and then arranging, making um, uh, efforts to help arrange for people to get access or to start to perhaps set goals. And it sounds like some of you have already said goals are part of what you're doing with people, so that's really great. Associated with um, the five A's a model, you want to also think about um, the five R's and really think about um, really looking at when you're, um, you know, having these dialogues, really talking about relevance, really thinking about that um, uh, how um, what this is going to be relevant to in their life that's going to make it a really motivating, important thing to do. Think that's really important and that really strengthens people's readiness and that strengthens people's really success in taking action. So really trying to find that relevance. And when I talk about the wellness model, some of that will come into play possibly a little more. What are some of the risks that are associated with um, cutting down or quitting? And risks, um, you know, smoking can, for many of us is a real tool for managing stress, being socially connected. Um, it fills a lot of needs in a lot of ways. So there's some risks that are going to be, especially as um, it fills some needs, it fills a void. This is something that has to be explored and help the person to understand that so we, they can figure out for themselves what's going to be the replacement or what's going to be the adjustment. And also rewards. What are the rewards that they can give them if they put together a plan? What are the rewards that can be built into the plan to help you know, be the, sustain the motivation and keep people motivated, as well as um, roadblocks that people are going to encounter. And that's so really important to do some anticipatory guidance work with people to think about the different roadblocks that might come down the road that might support their efforts wow. towards their plan. And then repetition is really important to keep supporting people and be thinking about that ask, advise, assess, assist, arrange, you know, really being repetitive and really going back and being supportive in that way because that can really help people to keep it fresh in their mind and hopefully something that they fully continue to do and their um, you know take some efforts. I have on the um, on the work on the handout there's a whole listing of questions that you can think about using motivational interviewing strategies around expressing empathy, which is a really important piece, as we talked about um, the risk, the relevance and risk questions, and then eliciting that change talk, and then supporting people's self-efficacy. Really important one to build on people's belief in their capacity to do this and help them to build that um, capacity to really be um, you know, successful in their efforts and make those small and steady positive gains in terms of being successful. So I encourage you to review that handout and think about some of those strategies as you are thinking about how you are asking people about this, perhaps advising them in a way that's relevant and personally meaningful to them and assessing where they're at together with them to see um, if they want to be assisted and or they want your help with arranging them to help create some kind of a quick plan. So um, I'm going to go on to next the idea around quitting. So you know this is really when people are a little further along. You know it's not um, you know um, when they want they're more, when those other levels of um, change where where people start to su develop the quit plan. Really important to help people review past attempts as it related to the previous um, couple slides talked about finding those successes in those plans and those roadblocks and those challenges that people face. Um, really important, a lot of work has been done on helping people to set the date. Um, and you know, not make it like tomorrow, helping them to set a date that really seems to be one that is reasonable for them and that they feel can be in their reach and that they can really try to be working with you on helping to create the plan or do the planning around it that's going to help um, them to be successful. Um, the um, idea about um, telling others is also sometimes, they, they say that that works, some people may not want to, so that's something you want to um, ask people, but um, people do um, 
say that by telling others and making it public is something that really helps them to um, be um, able to um, get that support, get that understanding from those friends or families, and then really anticipate those challenges, thinking about especially what's the challenges in the first hour, the first 24 hours, the first week, the first month, thinking about giving some context to the challenges that people might face to help them to brainstorm and problem solve some of the habits and routines or lifestyle changes that they might need to make or they might start to anticipate. Um, the other thing to help people to think about is arranging for the support and finding people that are going to um, help um, support them in their um, efforts and getting that support system um, really to be in set. And, um, Many times people will also want to really try to look at things that are associated with tobacco, like ashtrays and matches and other kinds of things, help them to look at in their environment those things that they want to um, maybe either remove or need to get rid of or um, to help their house, those triggers not be there or those tools that might stimulate the um, relapse that might be out of their way. Um, and really get some kind of... Um, contact, in-person support contact, whether it can be through you or maybe there's peer support centers in your area that offer this kind of peer support and or quit lines or hotlines that might be available because it's really important to help people especially think through and then get that support and or give them the congratulations. I have, we have a colleague who just um, quit. Um, she's about three months and she's kind of just we check in with her and she gives us to the minute, to the hour, to the second of when she quit. She has a thing that she has a timer on and she'll just tell us and it's really cool because she set that up and it's a, it's a personal motivator for her but when she announces to us when, what's that number, it's just such a, makes her smile and it makes us smile and it seems like it really worked well for her. So helping people to have those check-ins, have those kind of tools that kind of keep people um, you know, motivated towards their goal and then feel the success that I'm three months and one day and two seconds from my time that I last had a cigarette, you know, when someone can announce that publicly. Um, and um, so be, uh, before I um, go a little further, just check in any questions. I want to just check in quickly any questions or comments around um, the four the five A's or the five R's or are moving into thinking about um, starting to help people quitting support tips, anything that has been successful using any of these kind of strategies in your work um, that you'd like to share or questions you have about any of the strategies. I don't see any hands raised at this time and no questions currently. Okay, great. I'll keep continuing. Just feel free to shoot out your questions or comments or just real successes in doing any of this work because it's really always helpful to hear what has happening or what you're doing. Um, so um, the relapse, like I mentioned, is a really important piece and it's just part of the dialogue we want to have with people and help people to because, as we said, it's going to be a lot of attempts before people really make that um, full, can really, you know, rip themselves of those chains as it, chains as it had in that one slide. Um, you know, um, uh, re support for recent um, quitters. So really ask them out and document smoking status and, you know, really help to look at potential um, uh, relapse or, you know, things that are going to trigger people that might, um, you know, if they are in this, and know that it might cause more anxiety, it might cause more stress, and it may be influencing their mental health and their other addiction issues that they might be dealing with. So figure out maybe that our support needs to kind of ramp up in those ways, or we want to help incorporate some of that dialogue around this with people to help them in planning, and then really assisting them to kind of keep with their plan that they have, and perhaps figuring out other kind of support strategies for the follow-up with people to help them to continue to stay, you know, smoke-free during this time. And But really thinking about it because sometimes there's a lot of association with depression. People feel more depressed. People often will gain weight. 
and or they'll be more vulnerable to stressors. So really thinking about that and understanding that and talking that through with people so they can anticipate when they do have those depressive feelings, what can they do, and or when the weight gain might happen, if there's things that people will do to help curb the appetite or maybe get more physically active, if that's something that they might be interested in doing or could be part of their plan, and or help them to find how to deal with the stressors that they might be encountering. Um, many people do often, you know, use medications, and that's something some settings have used, and um, sometimes that is a thing that does people help with some of those different areas. Um, I wanted to bring us to, um, you know, there's a lot of people when we think about the pre-contemplation, understanding the, and getting the support for the undecided smoker. Um, and encourage you to look at that handout that I have on the motivation, um, to, things to motiv enhance motivation to quit, um, is really, um, this is so important, like not to just give up that we can't, you know, oh, they don't want to, they don't want to talk about it, but it's important not to bang it over people's head, but to explore it, the relevance of quitting, knowing that people are at this risk, as we saw physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually, all these things get affected to the relevance of quitting to help them pursue perhaps a goal that you're helping with them. You know, helping them to understand the risk, not lecturing, but understanding how to bring it to a relevant goal that they have or a relevant thing in their life. Really tying it to the rewards that they might see as valuable rewards for themselves in quitting, being able to keep up with their grandchildren, to be able to hold them, to be able to take them to the park, those goals and those things that they want to do in their life, how cutting down or quitting might give them that energy, give them that ability to have the wind, to keep the walking and do the tasks that they might want to do to be able to care for a grandchild or care for a child, helping to link to those things as it's relevant, as well as um, the rewards now. Rewards for me was money, you know, with cigarettes costing. Now, you, um, I tried to look this up, and I would say I'm just estimating, say, for example, it's $5.45 uh, a pack, perhaps. Like, it's not that in New Jersey. It's almost double that. Um, but it, that could translate into one almost $2,000 a year if a person smokes a pack of cigarettes a day. So how a person could see about, you know, looking at the financial rewards and perhaps it gets them a car on the road and a, the car leads to a job. There's a lot of things that can open up for people in terms of a reward and particularly the financial one. Um, and then helping people to really um, brainstorm and problem solve and do that problem solve together. It's that looking at that problem solving and exploring the barriers and challenges together. And then this is really where a lot of those um, motivational, those expressing empathy, eliciting the change talk, and supporting self-efficacy self comes in using some of those strategies here. Um, so I talked about, um, you know, the first two areas, and now I'm going to move into, like, the wellness. This is a really good way to think about helping um, people to frame how they can cut down or quit smoking. And, um, perhaps a model that, you know, you're already using or you might want to build into your um, work with people. So, you know, so smoking affects so many things. And when we think about wellness um, and we see how this wellness model works with each of the circles, of, you know, has an influence on each other, so the physical area often gets impacted, as was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. and um, it starts to be impacted, so it's going to have an impact on our occupational self, our spiritual self, our um, social self, financial, emotional, environmental, and intellectual, So, because it all touches there. So when we work with people and you start to think about a wellness approach to uh, smoking cessation, you can help to introduce them to the wheel of wellness and understand where, okay, physical is just this one area, but Sometimes it can blow up and really start to affect those other areas. But how can we use this in a way to help people see that they can be successful in cutting down and quit or smoking that can have an effect in a positive way on those other various dimensions? So I like to define wellness, too, because the wellness has to do with our lifestyle. 
and what we are, what, the work you're doing with people in trying to help them cut down and or quit smoking is helping them to reestablish that wellness lifestyle being a balance. So it's a balance of those different health habits that we have, those important ones, the idea of sleep and rest, a very important um, area for mental and emotional well-being. And probably a lot of your work is helping people with their sleep and rest to help them manage their mental health and or addiction problems. There's a lot of work that shows helping people with that good sleep hygiene is going to help them. It also really relates too with the smoking because perhaps there's some interrelationship that you have to explore with how smoking in, comes into play with sleep and rest and as we're helping people cut down and quit, helping them to think about that. Eating, the type of eating, you know, eating well, that's important, new, good nutrition, physical activity, product, participation in meaningful activity as um, are in support of relationships. These are part of that balance. And we know for sure a wellness lifestyle with this balance can really be enhanced when we help people to reduce and or eliminate tobacco or other substances. So that's like really a big piece of what you're probably already doing, you know, and or, you know, you want to move towards this a little stronger in a way of addressing the tobacco and or issues to help people to actually create that uh, wellness lifestyle. So what we are suggesting as a model, as you think about using the stages of change and moving towards using that um, uh, assessing, assisting, and arranging with people, one of the things we, you can do with people is help them to explore the um, what wellness, the, what's going to happen in terms of their wellness by cutting down or quitting uh, smoking or use of you know some type of tobacco tobacco product you can replace there, can impact their wellness in what ways. So help them to explore as you're assessing their motivation or their interest or their readiness, what's it going to do in terms of their physical, um, you know, wellness? How is it going to help that um, in that way? Socially, what is, how is um, well impacting um, our social dimension? Now, this is where when you start to have these dialogues with people, you're going to see where it might influence their social network and they may feel the fear of losing a social network because that social network is very connected to smoking. So this is really going to help having these kind of dialogues with people, helping them to explore some of those things that might be those barriers or challenges. Um, spiritually, some of the ways that um, cutting down or quitting smoking can enhance or um, hinder their spiritual wellness, the mental and emotional. You'll see a lot. This is really where a lot of conversations should be happening around the different how um, smoking, because often people are saying it's helping them deal with their stress, dealing with their feelings. It's helped. It is a tool for them, really, to help explore that and help them figure out that replacement and/or figure out those strategies that's going to help replace the smoking um, for them intellectually, how it can work, um, occupationally. I also put leisure too. It's not on the, the, um, the um, wheel there, but leisure is really sometimes often part of people's occupational wellness. So thinking about those leisure activities, think about those occupational activities. And again, that's what we definitely will, that's the, probably the first one you want to go to with people is help them to figure out the cost savings perhaps that could be the benefit of um, cutting down or quitting smoking, and then also their environment, helping them to think about their living environment, their car environment, their working environment, all the different environments where people are at, how it can help support them in that way, you know, to um, think about how cutting down or quitting may impact their wellness in those different areas. So um, I would like to open it up to um, a question about how do uh, you see perhaps using this kind of a grid in your exploration with people around helping them to assess and assist them. How would you use something like this in your work? And, and I'd like to hear any kind of comments on that.
not seeing any hands raised or anything in the comment box yet. Okay. Well, I'd like to hear what. How would you, um, if you could use something like this? How, how, how do you? Does it seem useful, or does it not? Maybe seem useful in your work with people and helping them explore cutting down or quitting. Does it seem like it might not work, or you think it could work? Maybe people could just even just in the chat, yes, no. Will you know just to hear your comments about seeing how it could or might not be able to work in your work in, in terms of implementing it. Uh, Cynthia Heron, um, your your phone line has been open. All right, thank you very much. Um, I this is a subject that's very dear to my heart. I'm an ex-smoker, and I I enjoy coaching people, and and I I love to to uh, celebrate with them as they make this decision. But I'm looking at this grid and I'm thinking um, a lot of times you know people have always ask people um, you know what their the obstacles are that uh, that they might overcome I don't ask it in that way but basically asking them what they feel they're um, they're you know on a scale of one to ten how successful they feel they would be in in this goal and uh, then asking them, you know, well, you know, if they say, well, three, um, ask them, you know, well, what, what gives you that confidence that, you know, you didn't say zero, and and so, you know, using something like this, you can you can, t I mean, we're a whole person, and I, I work with healthcare home, um, and you know, integrated healthcare, um, you could use it to to. Um, work on that and, and then ask, you know, just bringing these different dimensions to their mind just so that they can look at, look ahead and see, um, you know, okay, well, one of the problems that, that people would say, they, you know, they may say, okay, I, I, I have a really great uh, support group at, at my church, okay, so spiritually you could put something real, something positive in that area. Mm -hmm. um, they, you could, if they say, well, you know, but, uh, and I would, I would, um, I would save money. Mm -hmm. You could add that to the financial area. Um, I might be able, you know, whatever their, whatever their positives are and their negatives, put it in this area and try and build on it is what I would do and, and look for those positive aspects. Um, I, I know that, uh, See, one of one of the things like like the oh I have just so much I, I could talk forever about it I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. It sounds like you but, really see how it can be incorporated into the work you're already doing to help kind of flesh it out a little more and then help help people to see like the positive value of how you know holistically this is going to help them. Right. I can see right now with the environment that's one question that uh, that's usually an obstacle for a lot of people and social um, and you touched on that you, you talked about that um, you know it, it changes the, the social aspect of their life and uh, and I think that having something like this where they can they can have it in print when you when you discuss it like with the social aspect uh, a lot of people have you know all their friends smoke um, when you when you work on on helping them to overcome some of these obstacles, I mean this is an air this is a place where those notes can be taken and and when they come across these obstacles, they would have those notes. Um, you know, one thing I I recommend is that to avoid secondhand smoke with their friends, don't ask their friends to stop smoking, but just let their friends know that hey, you know. Um, yeah, go ahead and smoke. Uh, I'm going to step outside while you do. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and let them know that I might not be able to join you for this or that at this point, but it's not about you. It's about yeah. um, my effort not to smoke, but I'll join you on right. things that are non-smoke, you know, that are not related to smoking. But mm -hmm. and so that's really part of the social and the communication yeah. with people. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks so much for sharing that and that you see how it can work. And hopefully even the next 
um, one will go into a little more detail on that. But um, great to hear, you know, that you're doing some work in this area and using your own successes to build on that and um, that this can work well. And, you know, we'd love to hear how it works as you, you know, use it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Katie, is there um, anyone else who's raised their hand or has any comments about, um, you know, thinking that this could work or may not work for them? Yeah, we actually have a few few comments um, that came in. Um, Jessica Walker had said uh, we can use it when we set our annual health-related goals. The clients could post it to keep up their motivation. Great, excellent. Yeah. Then um, Katie Openlander said, I think it could be an extremely useful tool to help people see that smoking impacts so many areas of their life instead of just their physical health. Great. Okay. Yeah. And then Lisa Schwarz said, um, this tool seems to coordinate well with motivational interviewing and wellness coaching and could be used depending on client readiness. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah. We have one more <laughs> from Melissa Corey. Um, I feel that it would be very helpful as I work with teenagers, and if I can help them quit now, then that will help diminish their criminal behavior as they are not old enough to make this purchase. Um, I use the idea that if they can quit for 60 days, then why should they go home and begin smoking again? Um, when their body has been purified by not smoking. Mm -hmm. So finding different motivational strategies. And um, I, I think, uh, Pat, are you on the call? Maybe you want to add anything into using it? I think Pat uh, Nemec might be on the call. Didn't want to know if you wanted to add anything. I've unmuted your okay. line, Pat. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I just I wanted to add to this particular slide that yeah. I think it's really important to talk about by cutting down or quitting smoking. These are the ways I can impact other wellness dimensions in positive ways. Mm -hmm. uh, it yeah. was interesting in the comments that these also could be barriers. I certainly mm -hmm. think that's true. Um, one of the things that we know from a wellness coaching practice, and Peggy and I have been recently reading stuff uh, that co corroborates this in the research, is the critical importance of smoking, uh, not smoking, focusing on the positive aspects, um, things you're already doing, uh, things that are positive, things that are benefits, rather than uh, focusing on barriers and challenges. While you want to address barriers and challenges, I think too often we're we're drawn to the negative or drawn to the problem because of the nature of the work and the nature of our training and the nature of our documentation. And it's often difficult to remember to to emphasize the positive. So that's my yeah. comment about this slide. Great. Great. Yeah. So helping people to see the benefits it's gonna have impacting of it. And as we move to the next slide, which kinda of um, uh, I think that this is one tool to use, and these are like things you could just use, you know, in different ways as you are thinking. This one really helps to see the big picture, the whole, uh, you know, sees the whole eight dimensions and, you know, the whole model. And then the next one is a way of a tool of maybe exploring and drilling down the physical domain, um, and especially um, thinking about, um, how you know how it can affect these other domains because it definitely has a real direct impact. Um, it can have a very positive direct impact on these different areas: physical activity, as I mentioned, people feeling more energized and able to be more physically active. Um, people able to have more energy um, to do things. It's going to really affect that physical um, activity level for people in a certain way, depending on what their um, interests are. Eating well, it will have, you know, sometimes like we say, that might be the area people gain weight, but often it's just helping people to develop that way of um, getting better into healthier eating habits that, um, you know, are keeping people in feeling well. Definitely the stress management and relaxation, how it can help people in these ways in terms of managing stress. 
dealing with um, ways that they can find things to do to relax and or and also the sleeping and rest and helping them to understand um, the relationship on how it can help perhaps their sleep cycle. That's something that can be a real challenge for people, especially people who wake up in the middle of the night and would have a, uh, a cigarette and things and help them to find alternatives to doing that and or getting back into a more uh, re regular sleep and rest cycle. Access to screenings, you know, how this is going to definitely help their numbers on their screenings. We could go into, you know, if those of you wellness coaching training, you should know a lot more about the screening things, but um, they're going to start to see major changes in their numbers around their blood pressure, blood, sh um, perhaps blood sugar, um, other kind of um, CO2 um, reading. That's something I didn't mention here in this presentation, but I encourage sometimes programs have gotten, you know, CO2 monitors and are doing some of that, helping people to understand that. Um, and particularly, depending on more than likely the people you're dealing with are dealing with some kind of a medical condition. It's probably by cutting down or quitting going to really help the, the recovery and the management of many of the medical conditions that they probably have. So similar to the other activity, you could use this together and or separately or probably both would be good for them to see the big picture, but um, you, know, do it, you know, do it with people in chunks so people don't get too overwhelmed with it, but it definitely can strengthen their motivation like had, was said and could be used as you're doing their annual or um, you know, regular goal planning around their physical health goal. Um, I also didn't have in here, but I did want to um, highlight the value of um, habits. Like really, it should even really come in as another line here, but the value of habits and routines, because what's going to happen, and this is really where a lot of your work is going to be doing around helping people to explore, is new habits and routines that people need to develop, reestablishing habits, creating new routines. So really helping um, to ex um, explore those um, habits that are supporting those smoking behaviors so then you can help them to alter and replace them with new habits and routines that can help them. And they really, I love this slide here because it really gives you a whole bunch of different things that are so, uh, seem so simple, but a lot of these things are part of what can help people recreate those habits and routines. People do talk about drinking more water as a replacement and taking a sip of water a little more regularly, having that available to them to you know, be a way to um, deal with that, you know, um, urge to pick out a cigarette and have a cigarette. You know, thinking about the physical activity things that people can do and or eating better, um, a, a habit that's going to help replace, you know, it does, you know, finding ways to find low calorie kind of foods that are healthy that can replace that urge when people start to get the urge to have a cigarette. And again, you know, just getting people involved in their life and involved in other things because the more you're occupied doing things, the, re the, the, um, the need for smoking and the, the capacity to be smoking is reduced when you're doing something else that you're engaged in and involved in. And I think that helping people to reestablish those kind of habits and routines. I was going to have a, um, a couple of people, I guess a couple of peers that have been successful recently. Um, to tell me some of the things that they have created some new habits. So a couple of them talked about, you know, having grapes available and having nibbling on those um, as part of, um, you know, something when there was an urge and or an apple because the apple, one fellow was telling me, you know, took a long time to eat. It helps to really quench, you know, it just gets, he said that it really helped him a lot to have those apples on hand. And he was a pretty, pretty, pretty heavy smoker and having that available to him and as a replacement. You know, people can be walking, riding bikes, doing those things. Gum is something, you know, sometimes people think from dental care, that's not such a great thing, but many people say that it really helped them or it helped them with that. And or an activity. I um, used, one of the things I did as part of my new habits was got into more swimming and more, um, at the time it was swimming. Now it's a couple of other different things but that was a really good habit to replace that, um, you know, because I was able to, like, limit my smoking, but I was able to replace that time with that activity and now other kinds of activities. 
And a big one, which we probably is part of a lot of your work, is just breathing. It's helping people to do breathing exercises and or yoga and or mindfulness meditations that um, because there is something to the smoking around that, um, you know, requires people to, you know, you're, you know, your smoking is a breathing and helping people to reestablish a way of doing breathing in a mindful kind of way. And that could be part of some of your help in teaching people or linking them to classes around that um, that could be really helpful for them. So um, we looked at this idea of a wellness approach to smoking. Um, I um, also gave you at the end there some um, a program called Choices, which I encourage you. This is an article about it in a little, you can link there for more information about it. It's a peer-to-peer -to -peer tobacco education advocacy program that, um, you know, in New Jersey here, but it's been gone, you know, people around the country are adopting this, and I, you could always read this or contact Dr. Williams and her team, and they'd be happy, I'm sure, to, you know, to maybe even do a follow-up uh, webinar or technical support around how they develop this peer-to-peer -to -peer tobacco education. I also gave you um, some Dr. Jill Quit um, tips that, um, we're on her website, and she's definitely someone who is an expert um, in this area of tobacco dependence. Who I would really, um, you know, encourage you to look at some of her work and her research around smoking. Some of it, you know, really fell, falls nicely into a lot of the things we've talked about today. Give you some more real practical strategies. Um, so um, I just really want to open it up for. Um, questions uh, before we go and um, see if there's any other questions on any of the things that I talked about today. Um, I'm going to go back to the beginning of just outlined my learning objectives just to see if we covered them okay and any questions that you feel you have related to how we can help you uh, use this wellness approach to smoking cessation. So any questions um, you know, these were the objectives, and I wanted just any questions we can do to help you put this into work in your in your settings. Uh, Fred Hudson had his hand raised. Um, your line is unmuted. Okay. Hi, Fred. Uh. Fred, did you have a question? Your line's unmuted. Oh no, sorry. I was just going to send information about the uh, <clears throat> about the program I, I spoke about earlier. Great, great. Wonderful. Do you have any questions around the um, you know today's session on the the idea of underst better understanding the prevalence of tobacco use or smoking culture and the skills and a wellness approach? Do you have any any thoughts on you know was this useful or anything we can share with you to help you put it into practice? I think this was uh, actually pretty, you know, really great. And uh, I am planning to start using a lot of this both in, uh, in my group work as well as in doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching that I'm planning to do. Great. Well, if there's anything we could specifically help you with, feel free to send an email. Right. I'm not seeing any more hands raised. Yeah. Okay. Pat, do you have any um, comments before um, uh, to get anybody um, thinking about any ways of implementing any of the different areas or anything around the four different um, bullet points we talked about today with the prevalence, the culture, the skills, or the wellness approach? Yeah, uh, am, am I unmuted still? Um, you're okay. I just, you yeah, I just wanted to uh, underscore what you're saying about the new habits. One of the things that we know from research on goal achievement is that it's easier to add behaviors than to eliminate behaviors. It's easier to do more of something, to achieve a goal that involves doing more of something than it is to achieve a goal that involves doing less of something or not doing something. So one of the, although uh, I have never been a smoker myself, there have been a number of other things that I've learned over time to quit 
And part of the quitting that I find works best is to have something else to do instead. And one of the challenges that I know that's certainly true about people who smoke is that smoking is so attached to so many things in your life. It's something a lot of people who smoke, smoke when they get up, they smoke when they have coffee, they smoke, take a break from work on purpose to smoke. And one of the things that I hear people say kind of as a joke but kind of as serious is, um, you know, if I didn't smoke, I'd never take a break. And so there are all these new habits that people need to build in that both replace smoking and also uh, are sort of alternatives to smoking. So one of the things that you said is think about the habits connected with the things connected with smoking that are positive things, like taking a break, like relaxing, um, and uh, build, try to build those into your life in some other way or help the person you're coaching build those into your life in some other way. And one of the best examples for me is a friend of mine who was working as a contractor was talking about quitting smoking, and one of the things he said was that he get into the middle of a sort of a, a naughty problem around fitting some construction thing into some part of a, a room or a building. And he would go out and sit in his truck and have a cigarette. And the, the cigarette, it wasn't a cigarette, but he thought about it as a cigarette as being really his problem-solving tool. And it wasn't the cigarette itself, really. It was sort of having something to do with his hands when he was thinking through the problem. And I think if he took a walk or something like that, he probably could have solved, done the problem solving in the same way. But, you know, always when you're talking about addictions or, or quitting something or giving up something, it's important to talk about what you're going to do instead and also to talk about what are the benefits that you get out of it and how can you get those benefits in some sort of alternative way. You want to add to that, Peggy? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I think that's why I put these um, ideas, I kind of gathered them from some people, and how I think that you can, you really want to explore that with people so they can reestablish those habits and routines that are really going to help them keep, in, um, you know, they're going to um, be part of their quit plan, and then they're going to help them in that maintenance mode to be uh, able to maintain their, you know, be smoke-free and help them to have that same need or same you know, the smoking just gets so ingrained into some of these other things, and it's just like starting to reestablish those new habits and routines. I think really, really important to think about that with people as you're coaching and supporting them and help that be part of the plan that they set in the support that you give them and continuing to explore that as it went back into like the relapse discussions and dialogues, just kind of bringing those up and exploring those and then helping people to see the connections. But um, uh, we've seen people really do some really good work and, you know, really cut down and or quit, mostly quit, and be able to be pretty, um, you know, come up with those um, new habits and routines. And then just there was a lot of things people just didn't even anticipate. But um, that's where you guys can do some really good problem solving and brainstorming together with people. And um, I think the biggest thing that I think that really makes this nice is that you bring it in the context of wellness. Pat said, you use the strengths approach. The wellness approach is a very more inviting way for people to keep engaged in the dialogue, and it really um, helps people to see that they have aspects of themselves that are well and that they can continue to strengthen. And I think that wellness wheel is a really nice uh, thing to keep using in your work and um, keep, especially when it comes to uh, the smoking sensation. That's why, you know, we've called this presentation this afternoon uh, a wellness approach to smoking cessation. And I think um, we're really ex be interested to see how, um, what your experiences are using this. Um, and um, hopefully, you know, you kind of find ways to share it back with us to help um, see how it's working in your day-to-day uh, -day work with people, coaching and supporting them uh, in terms of their health. And I think the biggest thing as it, you know, as we start to wind down and think about this is I think the biggest thing as we highlighted that the troubling trend, I think the work that you do is going to help really 
influence that trend in a better positive way. And I think that that's really when it can get frustrated and, and um, when this work can become frustrating and difficult. Just remember that you can really be making a big impact on, in terms of the quality and the quantity of people's years lived by really addressing this. And it's hard work, but it's worthy work, I think. It's definitely worthy of the attention or worthy of the effort, despite sometimes sometimes it's seeming so challenging. But um, I really want to just congratulate all of you for you know being so interested in this topic and doing the work that you're doing already. And really um, hopeful that some of what we've uh, covered today will um, help you in your work. So um, I think no, we have about like um, probably about eight more minutes to go. So do you have any closing remarks, Katie, like on housekeeping things or any other calls that we want to take any questions from or comments? Um, we had a couple more comments come okay. through. Um, Lisa Schwartz said, wellness coaching personal narratives related to tobacco sensation um, okay. likely will be a very effective tool. Um, and then right. Cynthia had also said, I try to help my clients understand that every time they try to quit, even if they fail, they have taken a step closer to quitting if they can learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Very good. Great. Yeah. Um, we don't have any other hands raised or any other comments coming in, um, but I, I would like to let everybody know that this has been recorded and I will be posting it to our Relias um, learning system and it will also be posted on the wellness website um, for people to view and um, I will follow up shortly with a um, survey for the webinar and also um, the information that Fred had um, mentioned earlier on the learning about um, healthy living, tobacco, and you. Um, so please be looking for a follow-up email and um, we thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. We hope it's helpful and good luck with your efforts. I think you, you know, it's really excellent that you're really interested in helping people and good luck with that. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Okay. Bye.